The place, Annapolis. The time, the last day of my duty tour as Army Liaison Officer to the Naval Academy. The impacts of those two years, of great traditions and the tenets of dynamic sea power, these will endure. The monuments to the past at the Academy have become more than curios to me. They are expressions of pride in a great past which has shaped our Navy. But even more than the past, the present has left me with an overpowering conviction that the United States Navy is as much an expression of this nation's will and its ideals as it is a superb fighting service dedicated to the preservation of those ideals. Three-fourths of our planet is ocean, 330 million cubic miles of it, and all of it the Navy's domain, in peace and in war. The Navy is the essence of sea power. Its greatest weight in the affairs of men derives from one simple fact. It is there, not a fleet of blueprints, hopes, or plans, but a fleet in being. its very existence, this fleet and being is a deterrent to would-be aggressors who prowl the same oceans with weapons of supersonic death. When we think of the uneasy truce called peace, so frequently assailed by an ideology pledged to our destruction, the reality of the Navy looms larger than ever. This Navy of ours, rooted in the past, is also a Navy capable of meeting the lethal dangers of the present. As the enemy grows stronger with every tick of the atomic clock, so too our Navy gains nuclear sinews daily. It has become a Navy of giant aircraft carriers with flight decks three times the length of a football field. force, the Marine Corps, is an arm of that sea power. Throughout the Navy's history, whether landing on enemy shores in whale boats or helicopters, the Marines have added greatly to the Navy's versatility and flexibility in the accomplishment of its mission. It is an up-to-date Navy of electronic profile, a Navy of sleek, nuclear-powered silhouettes with missile systems more lethal than the biggest batteries of floating rifles. The Navy's nuclear silent service is logging history with tremendous accomplishments. The submarine Nautilus was the first to cross the polar cap under nuclear power beneath the ice. The Triton, first to circumnavigate the globe submerged, traveling 41,500 miles in 84 days without refueling. The Sea Dragon and the Skate, first to rendezvous at the roof of the world. And the Sargo, 
first to cruise 31 days under the ice cap, crossing the North Pole 16 times. Considering the total balance of the Navy, there is an area of might beyond the sum total of its offensive potential. It represents the power to keep the peace. In these days of neither peace nor war, the United States Navy has helped in large measure to stay any aggressor's hand by creating a weapon to serve as a deterrent. It takes an immortal event to immortalize a moment in time, and such a moment flashed into being when from the depths of the Atlantic, a missile emerged, the Polaris. Test shot after test shot, the Polaris has traveled its supersonic 1,500-mile journey to the target, blazing a tribute to the service which brought it into being. With 16 nuclear-tipped Polaris missiles aboard, the nuclear submarine carries more potential destruction than all the bombs dropped during World War II and Korea, a fact for all would-be aggressors to ponder. While the fleet is being reforged on the atomic anvil of our time, its traditions of the past remain a living thing. As the past is prelude to the present, so too the Navy of today and tomorrow sails in the wake of all its yesterdays. If tradition can have a beginning, then surely Captain John Paul Jones epitomized it in his immortal reply to the British offer of surrender. I have not yet begun to fight a tradition continued by men like Decatur and Perry. By Farragut and all the men of the Navy, past, present, and future. It gained beyond measure in the wars that were to follow, when in the First World War, the Navy convoyed two million soldiers across the Atlantic without loss of one life, and shepherded 100,000 merchant ships through U-boat infested waters. At the time of America's entry into the war, the German submarine wolf packs had almost brought the Allies to their knees. The Navy's ingenuity in devising new weapons against the German submarines was in the tradition of a fleet dedicated to secure the future of freedom. When for the second time in a generation war came to America, it was the Navy that took the first staggering blow at Pearl Harbor. Yet it came back with greater honor and power than anyone had thought possible and surprised the enemy with its audacity against overwhelming odds. In this Second World War, almost lost to tyranny, the Navy fought a two-ocean, two-front war. In the Atlantic, over which millions of American soldiers had to be ferried, Allied lifelines had to be kept open. It was round two against another generation of submarine wolf packs. In the Pacific, the Navy's pattern of counterattack became a classic. It was immortalized in the grinding years of seeking out the enemy fleet and destroying it in encounter after encounter. Only a pitifully few carriers, cruisers, and destroyers were available in that first year of the Pacific War. But the Navy made do with what it had. Skill and courage first tipped the scales at Midway. Sea, superb combinations of sea and air power spell disaster to a planned Japanese invasion of Australia.
Such victories at sea were followed by amphibious assaults on beach after bunker-studded beach. First by the Navy's own ground combat forces, the Marines, and later together with the Army. This team of Army and Navy made Japanese-held islands stepping stones to victory. The pattern also worked in the Aleutians, where the Japanese had gained a foothold. Gulf, the same deadly pattern was repeated. In one decisive night in Surigao Strait, the remaining Japanese fleet was sunk or crippled by battleships resurrected from the mud of Pearl Harbor. The enemy's last desperate gesture was reduced to kamikaze raids on a fleet that had come to stay. of a giant army vice closed on the Japanese in the Philippines and spelled the beginning of the end of the war in the Pacific. right and proper that the surrender terms should be signed in Tokyo Bay on board a Navy ship, the USS Missouri. the Navy, this moment would never have belonged to history. While the war in the Pacific moved toward its inevitable end, the greatest armada in history crossed the English Channel. Together with the British, the American Navy transported the assault troops to the beaches of Normandy, an operation of incredible complexity. Naval fire made a shambles of German bunkers and batteries in preparation for the assault.
with the assault troops ashore and moving inland, the man with the rifle voiced a heartfelt, well done. The long tradition lengthened in Korea. First at the Pusan perimeter and beyond, when flat tops of the Navy were the only close airfields available. Navy and Marine pilots provided sorely needed air combat support for the hard-pressed ground troops. Chan changed the course of the war. Without the Navy's command of the sea, there would have been no landing and no envelopment of the North Korean Army. The Navy's might made possible that end run, resulting in a crushing defeat of the Communists and for all practical purposes, the elimination of the North Korean People's Army from the war. If courage in battle is in the naval tradition, then no less is the Navy's fight against obsolescence. In the search for new and better naval weapons and tactics, experimentation and research are a naval constant. It is predicated on one idea, to enable American sea power to carry out the mission assigned to it. The naval line of technological development is, like naval tradition, a direct one. The sailing frigates gave way to the lumbering ironclads of the great white fleet. In due time, yesterday's battleships were retired to the mothball fleet and the salvage yard to be replaced by ships better suited to current needs. In naval technology, nothing is ever absolute. During the years after World War I, the Navy experimented with lighter-than-air aircraft, the Zeppelin. The helium-filled blimps briefly filled a need, and then they, too, joined the past. test bombs sank old battleships in the 20s, pessimists pronounced the Navy finished. Instead, the Navy accepted the airplane as merely another adjunct to sea power. With the advent of the aircraft carrier, it became part and parcel of the fleet and naval tactics. The result of the Navy's early experience with aircraft was dive bombing, developed and perfected in the years between the two world wars. Carrier-based dive bombers became the nemesis of Japanese ships during World War II. The modern attack carrier with almost a hundred supersonic jets and other aircraft aboard is the Navy's capital ship. The airplane did not herald the demise of the Navy, but instead extended its capabilities and power. The carrier 
also made possible a new dimension in amphibious landing technique, vertical envelopment. In naval usage, vertical envelopment is landing ground troops by helicopter behind enemy lines in the amphibious assault. This tactical maneuver, originated by the Marine Corps, is now accepted as standard. Underwater demolition is an important phase of naval operations. Frogmen like these in training can be released from submarines in enemy waters to plant demolitions or neutralize enemy obstacles. Refueling while underway is another Navy development. It has made possible greatly extended cruising ranges without need for an extensive base system. One of America's earliest contributions to sea power was the submarine, a weapon which had, and will continue to have, tremendous impact. It was also Navy men who first saw the value of nuclear power plants for submarines and developed them. With an armament of Polaris missiles, the reactor-driven submarine may have ushered in a new era in sea power. But certain it is that as a deterrent, it has greatly expanded the Navy's role as a power for peace in an uneasy world. Nuclear power plants have also been developed for surface vessels. The new guided missile cruiser Long Beach is just a harbinger of what is to come. Meanwhile, other vessels are being converted to guided missile ships. The guided missile has made its debut in the Navy, both as a surface to air and as a surface to surface weapon thus, like the airplane, extending both the range and lethality of naval firepower. Today, anti-submarine warfare has claim on a large portion of the Navy's attention. Whole task forces have been created to find new and more effective means for coping with the lethal threat of the missile-carrying submarine. But before a submarine can be destroyed, it must be found. The radar-equipped WF-2 Tracer can discover a snorkel even in rough seas. Another carrier-launched anti-submarine aircraft is the S-2F, called the Tracker. It is an all-weather, single-package weapon able to find, identify, and kill enemy subs by itself. The HSS-1 helicopter automatically hovers at a pre-selected altitude for dipping its listening device. It carries depth charges and homing torpedoes and can act as a sub-killer or guide surface vessels in for the kill. With the aid of new underwater detection apparatus and computers, surface vessels can launch target-seeking torpedoes. In the Navy, experiment and research go on unceasingly in all areas vital to the Navy's mission. mission also includes the exploration of Antarctica. The Navy ships have become an almost fixed feature on the frozen wastes of a new continent on the bottom of our planet. In cooperation with the Army, the Navy developed a new kind of roll-on, roll-off transport. These ships accept entire vehicles with their loads, either from shallow draft lighters at sea or from a pier. 
At the overseas port, the vehicles roll off under their own power, saving time and effort by eliminating, unloading, and again loading the cargo at the destination for land transport. The quest for progress in naval technology is paced by progress in the human equation. As always, the new is only as good as the men who use it. The knowledge and skill of the seagoing specialist far exceed the requirements of the past. The Navy sailor today must be expert in skills ranging from computer mathematics, through nuclear reactor lore and temperament, the mechanics of inertial guidance systems, to ability to distinguish one presence in the sea from the many, the presence of the deadly fish, the sub. The aircraft carrier has added a host of new and intricate skills to the naval roster never dreamed of in the Navy of yesteryear. the sailor specialist has in common with all the Navy men who have gone before. He is, first and last, a fighting man. States Army are proud to serve in defense of freedom on the same team with the Navy, custodian of a great tradition and a dynamic sister service. We salute the United States Navy.